tight. You know, that group was so tight knit, the senior class for Michigan. I talked to Danielle Roush earlier this year, and I asked what her future plans were. And she said that in a couple of years, whenever Coach Barnes Rico is done at Michigan, Nas Hillman's going to take over as the head coach of Michigan. <laughs> Danielle Roush is going to be her associate head coach. And Kim Barnes Rico, they're going to hire on as the director of basketball operations or a special <laughs> or assistant or something. But all that's to show you how tight knit this group is, how much they really loved each other. And that chemistry is what got them all the way to the Elite Eight. And they continued to make history over the course of their four years. Played really well last night. I mean, it did feel like all along Louisville was the better team, really, almost from the get-go. And yet you made the point, Michigan kept it close throughout this game. How were they able to do that? How were they able to have this be a game that was still in doubt in the last five minutes? Michigan was able to get the ball inside. And when they were able to settle down in the half court and get paint touches down low to Nas Hillman, that's when Michigan started to have some success. Emily Kaiser was able to dive down. Hillman is so successful when the double team comes. She can read out of the double team to the open teammate. That's where the Wolverines started having success. The problem with Louisville is they are so long and athletic. They play a 1-2-2 two, two press. Emily Angsler sits at the top of that 1-2-2 two, two press. She's 6-1, but until you see her in person, you don't understand how long her arms are. And that caused a lot of problems for Michigan. And I think the guards were a little intimidated by the tenacity of which Louisville brings when it comes to guarding in the backcourt. 22 turnovers resulted in 24 points off of those turnovers. So taking care of the ball, I think, ended up being the reason why they were able to lose. Yeah, it ultimately felt like it was somewhat of a similar script to the first time they played. Mm -hmm. The margin was significantly different. And again, give Michigan credit for that. But kind of coming into the game, there was this concern about turning the ball over and about kind of succumbing to Louisville's defensive pressure. And ultimately, it did feel like that was what what the, the kind of downfall of Michigan was in this game. And that's something that Louisville has been able to do all year to teams with the ACC. They turn people over 20 times a game. And Michigan had had trouble throughout this year with turning the ball over in the Big Ten. So that kind of did come back to bite them in this situation. However, credit the Wolverines and how they ha acted on the defensive side of the ball because there were five-minute stretches a couple of times in that game where Louisville wasn't able to score. So the transition defense was a lot better and just Forcing Louisville to grind it out in the half court, which is where you can have some success against the Cardinals because they like to run so much. Michigan was able to get that to happen a few times, but it just wasn't enough to overcome that two or three point hump where they stayed at for a lot of that game. Michigan uh, ultimately did not make a field goal for the last six and a half minutes mm -hmm. or so in this game. And again, it's really tough to win when <laughs> you don't score down the stretch. Nas Hillman, you mentioned it. Uh, did have some success inside, particularly getting herself to the free throw mm -hmm. line. But she ultimately made only four field goals in this game and turned the ball over four times. So, look, she was their double-figure scorer. She was the person they leaned on. But I still think if you're Louisville, you feel like you kept her reasonably in check. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think that they did in, in order to do that? Well, the first or second possession of the game, Michigan dumped the ball down to Hillman, and Emily Angster came over and just blocked her. And that's not something that happens to Hillman very often, getting blocked down the paint. So I think the length and the double team was somewhat intimidating, or it was very disruptive for that uh, Michigan offense. But what ended up happening in the third quarter was Michigan went on a 9-0 run because they got to the foul line and made nine straight free throws. So getting fouled and getting to the foul line really kept them in the game. It kept it tight. But the double team coming over and just the pure length. It's something that Michigan had, didn't really have to deal with in the Big Ten, the size and the length and the tenacity defensively that Louisville presented. No one else in double figures, though, for Michigan. Yeah. Ultimately, how big was that, that just kind of no one else was able to, to step up? Well, anytime you shut down a player like Hillman, which they didn't necessarily do, but anytime Hillman is taking up so much defensive attention, someone else has to step up. And I was impressed with Maddie Nolan coming off the bench, and she knocked down two threes in that first half. That really propelled Michigan offense. However, I looked to the fourth quarter. Leah Brown went down, and she had been really the Robin to the Batman of Nas right, Hillman right. throughout this season. And when Brown went out, that really took away a um, aggressive scorer. And everybody else on Michigan just didn't really hunt for their shots as aggressively as I would have liked to have seen them. With the exception of freshman guard Layla Filia, she was really strong taking it to the basket. But a lot of times, Michigan just couldn't finish some of the shots. They were getting good looks, but the ball just wasn't going in the basket. Let's try to put this season into perspective a bit here for Michigan. This is their deepest run ever. It comes on the heels of a season which saw their previous deepest run ever. So it goes Sweet 16 one year, the Elite Eight the next year. 
What do you make of this season from Michigan's point of view? Massive season. I mean, anytime you go to the NCAA tournament, that's a success, let alone getting to the Sweet 16, let alone getting to the Elite Eight. History was made with this crew, and I think that they're going to hang their hats on. This was one of the best teams that ever came through. But what impresses me most about this Michigan team is the chemistry that you saw with this team. From the beginning, when I started doing their games back in December or January, they all really like each other, and the chemistry in those practices and shoot-arounds was unbelievable. And you can tell when a team's about to do something special when everybody has each other's backs because you were going into battle day in and day out, not only in the Big Ten, but in the NCAA tournament. And that team really had each other's backs, loved each other, and you saw it with Danielle Roush in that press conference. They are all best friends in that senior class, and they were the core group that got Michigan to the Elite Eight. Really a powerful moment there, no question about Absolutely. it. And then you think big picture. Uh, Michigan was just not a factor in women's basketball, really, before mm -hmm. Kim barnes Rico came to campus. They had been to five NCAA tournaments ever. Mm -hmm. They've now been to five of the last nine tournaments. Again, successive, deepest runs in school history. What has she done to elevate this program? Why has she been the person who's been able to do what her predecessors were not? Well, first and foremost, she's been able to get excellent recruits to Michigan. And I think recruiting is something that we don't necessarily talk about as much regarding the importance of bringing in talent year in and year out. And that's something that uh, Kim barnes Rico has been able to do. Not to mention just finding a, an offensive system that works well based off of who you have. Nas Hillman was the anchor of that Michigan offense throughout her time at, in Ann Arbor. And other players bought into that and played off of it so well, and it worked well for the Wolverines. I also think the commitment to rebounding the ball was massive, especially in women's college basketball. Rebounding is a massive factor because you create extra possessions for yourself. Michigan was uh, averaged a plus 10 rebounding margin throughout the season, which was highly successful. When you have players committing to pursuing the ball and creating second chance opportunities, you have something special. But ultimately, Coach barnes Rico has a program that's built its identity on playing really hard, and they've had a ton of success now at the highest level possible. I want to ask you about one other thing from last night, not regarding that game, but I think a lot of us who tuned in to watch the Michigan game got sucked in beforehand to UConn NC State. It was an unbelievable game. Yes. It went to double overtime, and it went to double overtime because players made plays mm -hmm. down the stretch. I mean, it, it really was a fabulous game. It was hard, though, to sit there and watch the number one seed, NC State, play what essentially was a road game against UConn, who was the number two seed. So, again, had it been reversed, I, I, I'm not sure anyone would have had a problem with it. Had UConn been the number one seed, it was sure. said, well, they earned that right to play in Bridgeport. Give me a sense. I mean, that's just, I don't know a lot about, right, like kind mm -hmm. of the inner workings of this sport. But just sitting there on my couch watching this game, it felt wrong to me. What, what's kind of in the women's basketball community? What's the reaction to that? Well, first and foremost, I think anytime you can have a crowd like the one you had in Bridgeport, it's excellent for the game. And of we've course, had fantastic yes. crowds throughout this tournament. And that's why I really like these games to be at home sites for the first and second rounds, because you can draw fantastic crowds that you're not necessarily going to get at a neutral site. All that to say, NC State was the number one seed in that Bridgeport region. There was no reason for them to have to be the away team, essentially, in an Elite Eight game to go to the Final Four when they had worked so hard to get that number one seed. UConn had five losses on the year. Yes, it's an excellent team. They deserve to win that game. They ultimately fought it out. But once you get games that go into overtime, double overtime, the crowd becomes a massive factor. And you could hear it last night on television, and I think the crowd played a major role in getting UConn ultimately that win in a trip to the Final Four. So what's the solution? Like, what, what could they have done differently here? I mean, that's a great question, and I think it's something that the committee is going to have to ask itself because it's not fair for NC State to have to essentially play a road game. And I know if I'm NC State head coach Wes Moore, I am not happy with the situation that played out. Yes, again, UConn made plays down the stretch. Yeah. However, that should never have been a situation that NC State had to deal with to begin with. Right. Uh, Paige Beckers, by the way. Was Ooh, 27 points. I mean, but just every clutch shot in overtime. She's so good in the mid-range. Yeah, she was great. beautiful. She's great for the game. <laughs> she is. And yeah. again, UConn is great for the game. Fantastic. UConn has done amazing things to grow women's college basketball. But if you earn a one seed, you yeah, deserve to seed. be a one seed. Yes, you're one seed. Mm -hmm. And that, that means at best... At worst, you should play a neutral court game. 100%. Right. So, and again, when you talk about the first two rounds being at teams' home courts, it's at the home court of the highest-seeded team in that 
pod. Well, and there is a concept or yes. there is a you know rationale of the UConn bias that exists in women's basketball, and it's true, and I think you saw that play out last night in that Bridgeport region. I certainly feel bad for NC State in that scenario, but, man, that was a wonderful game. Fantastic game. Absolutely, down. absolutely great game. Morris frozen for birth for the Gophers since 2014. They got there by blanking the top seed Western Michigan Sunday in the championship of the Worcester Regional. Next week, they will head to Boston in search of the first national title for the program since 2003. Among those fueling this run, the Big Ten Player of the Year, Ben Myers. He is today's big interview, and he joins us from Minneapolis. Uh, ben, this is a program with so much tradition, but it has been a while since Minnesota's been in the Frozen Four, as I mentioned. What does it mean, particularly someone who grew up in the state, to be part of the group that's returned the Gophers there? Yeah, it's just been a really special season for us. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, a lot of us on this team are from Minnesota and we grew up watching this program our, our whole life. And, um, you know, we've seen highlights from the, the 02 and 03 runs. And then um, I'm sure most of us were watching in 2014, uh, the runner ups. And, um, you know, I think it's just uh, really special for us to be going back to the Frozen Four, knowing that um, it's somewhere this program has been for a long time. You guys had to rally from 3-1 down in the round of 16 in order to, to get to that Elite Eight game. You were taking on the defending champ in UMass, uh, got it into overtime, and then you won it with the game winner in overtime. Take us through that goal and, and what was going through your mind. Yeah, um, you know, we got down two zip, as you said, and, uh, you know, uh, UMass had a big crowd there and they were really into it. And um, our group was just really resilient the whole game. And and we stuck together and uh, and never stopped fighting. And then um, Aaron Huglin ended up giving me a just a really nice pass. And um, I was in the slot and was able to put it home for the, uh, the winner. Ben, one of the things that really strikes me about this team is just how much adversity it has been through this year. And we've talked about it quite a bit on this show. One of the things that, that obviously stands out is Coach Motzko uh, losing his son, Mac, in, in a car accident. H how did that galvanize this team? Yeah, um, you know, it's really tough for, for me to analyze that um, exactly. You know, I, I'm sure that was a situation that, that not many guys on our team had been, had been through, but... Um, you know, I'd say it, it just brought us closer together as a group. And, um, you know, we just try not to take things for granted. Um, obviously, you learn that, you know, things can change very quickly. And, um, you know, I think we've, we've stuck together the whole year, and, and that's something we learned from. Well said. Let's dive into your story a little bit. You played at a small school in a high school, Delano, uh, not too far from the, the Twin Cities, kind of an extreme suburb there. Uh, and then you decide to play two years of junior hockey instead of going uh, straight to college hockey. How do you think that that impacted your game and your development? Yeah, I think it was uh, really good for my development overall. Um, you know, I think if I would have went into college as a true freshman at 18 years old, um, you know, I wouldn't have been able to have the impact I did um, when I did uh, end up coming in uh, for my freshman year when I was 20. So... Um, I think just taking those two years and, and just focusing on um, my development and uh, just maturing, um, I think it just it really paid off for me. Now, I know you were originally committed to Nebraska Omaha. How did Coach Motzko change your mind and sway you to become a gopher? Yeah, um, you know, a uh, big thing for me was, you know, I'd be close to family and um, my parents and, and friends would have a chance to come to every game, which they pretty much have come to every home game. Um, Actually, I'm, I'm, yeah, they definitely have came to every home game. So that was a major fa factor for me. Uh, you, you mentioned kind of growing up following the Gophers. Was this kind of, uh, was it an easy pitch? I mean, was this a chance kind of, hey, I get the chance now to live out my dream kind of thing? Or, or was it a, a bit of a tough decision for you? Um, no, it, it wasn't too tough, honestly. Um, you know, it, it was, this was a dream school for me. And um, you know, he didn't have to sell me too hard. <laughs> Speaking of dreams, you got the opportunity to play in the Olympics this year, which is just amazing to me. I know the games did not turn out at the end the way you, you might have wanted them to, but, but Team USA certainly represented itself quite well. What, what's the biggest thing that you'll remember about that experience? Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, just getting the chance to represent your country and, and where 
those colors is um, something that I'll always remember um, and always look back on. And, um, you know, it's just uh, just so grateful for that opportunity. And, um, you know, I just tried not to take that for granted and um, really just enjoy the experience. Well, you played incredibly well since you came back. Uh, 15 points in seven games is a, a really remarkable stretch. How tough was it to reintegrate yourself back into this team? How were you able to do that as seamlessly as you seemingly have here? Yeah, well, honestly, it, it wasn't too hard. Uh, when the three of uh, the guys on our team left for the Olympics, you know, our team, um, they played incredible. They went uh, they went 5-0 and without us. So we came back and walked right into – to a really good hockey team. So, um, you know, I, I'd have to say it's pretty easy to play with uh, the teammates we have on this team. Oh, one of the other incredible stories this year is Justin Close and uh, Jack LaFontaine deciding in the middle of the season to go pro. Justin Close, who had been a bit player at best on this team, uh, steps in and has just been fabulous between the pipes. What, what have you seen from him in terms of why he was so ready to accept this challenge. Yeah, I think he's just a really mature kid. He's a, he's a great teammate and you know, he's got the respect of everybody in our locker room. So, you know, everybody, you know, we play for that guy. Um, and, you know, I mean, we all knew it all along that he was a really good player. So um, I think it's more of a shock to the nation than it is to, to the guys in our room. You have a decision to make coming up at the end of this year. You could come back and, and play another season or you could go to the NHL as an undrafted free agent. As you mentioned, you did take the two years between high school and junior, so you're an older player. What will be the factors that you will weigh as you make that decision? Um, I mean, honestly, I, I haven't really been thinking about it too much. I try not to think about it. Um, you know, we have the Frozen Four coming up in, in under two weeks, and, um, you know, those, those these are going to be the two biggest games of my um, my career so far, so um, that's really the only focus. All right, so let's focus on the Frozen Four. You have this matchup with Minnesota State coming up. I know your brother Nate played baseball there, so who's he rooting for? He's rooting for the Gophers. <laughs> yeah. Didn't take you long to answer that one. Yeah. All right, give, give us a sense for, for the strengths they bring. This is a team that knocked you guys out last year, so what, what what should you be preparing for? What are you prepared for in, in terms of Minnesota State? Yeah, it's a it's a playoff hockey game, and, and they play a really disciplined game. Um, they're a very hard team to play against. So, um, you know, a year ago, I don't think we were ready for that. And, um, you know, we got a, a major challenge ahead of us. And, um, you know, we're just going to take this next week and a half and, and really prepare and, um, you know, get ready for that game. You mentioned it's a week and a half, which is a long period of time to get ready for one game. How are you guys dividing up that time? Like, how much of it is spent on yourselves? How much of it is spent on Minnesota State? How much of it is spent on trying to get rest? What's, what's the balancing act here? Um, you know, I think uh, you get a lot of practice doing this um, during the year um, and preparing for different teams. But, um, you know, our schedule isn't isn't, you know, determined too far out. I think it's more of uh, the coaches seeing what we need uh, every single day and then giving us the game plan that way. And then um, as players, we kind of just follow along with that. What does it say about the Big Ten with two teams in the Frozen Four? Yeah, um, it's just a, I mean, it's it's unbelievable. Um, the games we've had with Michigan and, and also all the other teams in the Big Ten this year have been just unbelievable. And, um, you know, it shows just in a short time that this conference is, um, you know, is, is a great place to play college hockey. Well, Ben, congratulations on being Big Ten Player of the Year. A, a fabulous honor. Congratulations on heading to the Frozen Four and looking forward to seeing what happens here with you guys and Michigan as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. The women's lacrosse season is underway, and as always, the Big Ten is looking strong. Seven-time national champ Northwestern currently ranked third in the nation. Maryland, which has won 14 national titles, is eighth. Michigan, Rutgers, and Johns Hopkins in the rankings as well. And we are joined now by Big Ten Network analyst Kaylee Chelios, who joins us, part of a national championship team herself in her freshman year at Northwestern. So, Kaylee, let's go big picture first. Just give us a sense overall of the strength of this Big Ten this year. I think it's um, it's gotten a lot stronger in that the, the parity 
in the Big Ten is a lot better than what it used to be. It used to kind of have your your top four teams, and in lacrosse, you kind of used to have your top four teams, and they were the powerhouses, and there was a lot of separation um, between everybody else. But now it feels like overall, you know, the numbers 10 through 25, it, it's kind of anybody's game, and anybody can sort of beat you on any given day at, at this point. It's, it's just a much wider range of players, and part of that, too, is – there's a lot of players that are fifth years and, and players who have eligibility in the last couple of seasons due to COVID. And there's just so much talent around the league. So as far as the big 10 goes, um, you know, I think you've obviously got Syracuse, you've got Northwestern and, you know, Maryland are always up there in your top three. But as you go down and look at the list, I got to watch Michigan play Northwestern this past weekend. I've been following Rutgers a lot this season who've been playing fantastic and, Looking at Rodgers and Michigan, I mean, those are two teams that, you know, don't have a ton of high-end elite talent, but they have a lot of great role players, some great coaching. And they're two teams that I think, much like JMU beat Maryland the other day, that can beat you on any given day. And they're going to be, there's a big game between those two coming up. It's going to be interesting to see how that one ends up because it's really going to identify where one, two, three, four come in for the big 10 championship. So I think the big 10 has a lot of phenomenal players right now. And we've seen some really good games. It's interesting because we have seen the play of the league be more than just Northwestern and Maryland here in recent years. And, and kind of to your point, that seems to be the change. That being said, Northwestern was the unanimous preseason pick to win the conference. So how big is the separation between Northwestern and everyone else? Northwestern has some pretty elite players watching Girardi, Jill Girardi on the draw and uh, Lauren Gilbert, a player who you know, barely played her freshman year, wasn't a high recruit, is now one of the most dangerous players in the game. She just has incredible elite speed paired with work ethic. She's a, you know, of the mold of Kelly Amante Hiller and just the way she plays. and. Her and Jill Girardi, I mean, here's a look at some of her speed and her finesse. There's Girardi. She's got a bomb of a shot. She, I mean, she just plays with swag. I've really enjoyed watching her in the circle. She has some bite to her game. And those two players for Northwestern, to me, were the standouts and probably their best two players, at least for sure on the attacking side. But they're really hard to stop. So I think it's closer than you think watching Michigan play Northwestern. You know, they were really close. So you have to credit their goaltender, Wiseman. She was incredible for them. And had Michigan been able to convert on some of their chances, uh, their scoring chances, and, and finish their shots, it would have been an even tighter game. But they came within a couple goals of sending that one into overtime at one point. So that was an exciting matchup. And I think says a lot about where Michigan is at right now in terms of their depth and their consistency. This is probably the best Michigan team we've seen so far. So the gap between Northwestern and everyone else underneath is not that far off. And we're at the point of the season, um, you know, where teams need to find ways to separate. And when their game plans, you know, aren't working, how they adjust. And that's what separates teams from being elite and going on to play meaningful games in May and teams that don't. So I think the separation is much tighter. And I'm very curious to see how Rutgers and Michigan uh, do this weekend and, and how that's going to stack up because, they're two really good teams, and we saw what happened in Maryland this past week, and, and that could happen, I think, for sure in the Big Ten, too. When you talk about meaningful games in May, you're, of course, talking about the NCAA tournament. Uh, Northwestern is without Izzy Skane, who I know has been their leading scorer the last couple of years. She's out for the year. They have played the two teams ranked above them in the national polls, and it did not go great. Uh, they got beaten very soundly by both Boston College and North Carolina. What would Northwestern have to do to be a team that competes for a national title this year? It's a tremendous loss not having any Izzy Skane in the lineup. I mean, to try to make up for that production is pretty challenging. It's it's not going to happen, but you got to have players that can still contribute and find ways to win, which is what Northwestern has been able to do really well with Koykendall, Gilbert, Girardi. Um, you know, their numbers have been really impressive, and they're, they're producing at a much higher rate because of the loss to Izzy Skane. But... You're right. They had two bad losses, both to BC and North Carolina. And, you know, talking to Kelly Monte Hiller, she said that's really not those two games were not showing our best potential and what we can what we can really do. They were early on, which is a good thing, too. And I think since then, you know, they played a game against Syracuse. And since that game where they had to win in overtime, they've really matured as a group. 
and have had to find different ways to win games. Like I said, without Izzy Skane and knowing that they have to be better to contend with teams like BC and North Carolina. And a, a big problem too was last season, they didn't play anybody out of the conference. So they kind of got humbled and it was pretty hard for them to go, go against other teams that weren't in the Big Ten when it came down to playing in the NCAA tournament. And the same, I think, goes for Maryland with their loss to, to JMU recently. I don't think they were quite ready um, and knew what to expect from a, a team that they hadn't been pounding on in the last year. So uh, for Northwestern, I think, I mean, the sky's the limit for them. They have some serious talents, and it's it's really just a matter of execution and finishing their checks and finishing their shots and possession. I mean, there's a lot of really impressive uh, players in the draw circle right now, but I think Jill Girardi is among one of the best of them for sure. You mentioned Maryland. I think Northwestern and Maryland are the two programs here where you kind of measure them by do they make the Final Four and, frankly, do they win the national championship. As you said, uh, Maryland falling to James Madison. Give us a sense of where the Terps fit in the national picture, not so much in the Big Ten, but how they measured up against some of the other elite teams nationally. Both Maryland and Northwestern have elite coaches and some of the best in the game for sure. So their ability to to scheme and, and game plan and change their attack and their approach, much like Maryland will probably do moving forward and Northwestern will do against BC and North Carolina. Um, you know, they have an edge with their coaching uh, staff for sure. But Maryland, I think, um, you know, Alyssa Murray, former Syracuse lacrosse player, she writes for Inside Magazine. She had talked about how it was probably going to happen where JMU maybe upsets Maryland because they were playing really confident and maybe got complacent. And it was a good loss to have this early in the season so they can make the adjustments and make sure that they're ready when they're going to continue to play more players outside the conference. So Maryland, they don't have that like perennial attacker or midfielder or defender as good as um, Bosco has been for them on defense. I mean, Abby Bosco has been a tank, but they don't necessarily have that perennial midfielder that can do it all, win draws, go down on the attack, quick transition that we're so used to seeing them have, even when I played in the last 10 years, five years or so. So it's a bit different team, but again, they have tremendous coaching and they still can rely on their defense. That's been their, their MO. They're one of the best defensive teams and that's, been their biggest asset as well. So with Bosco leading the charge back there, I think they're still putting themselves in an elite company and will likely be able to go far in the tournament for sure. Kaylee, last thing I want to ask you, you'd mentioned that you'd seen Michigan this weekend. They gave Northwestern a really good game. This was a team that was picked last in the conference in the preseason. <laughs> Why have they been so much better than people expected them to be? Uh, I had a feeling that was going to be a much tighter game and I was hoping it would be. And I think the biggest thing was their anchor on D is their goaltender, um, Wiseman, and she's just underrated. She played with a lot of confidence. She had jam. She was aggressive, um, both in the crease and, and handling the ball, too. But she was their anchor. In the beginning of the game, I mean, there was a really high number of shots. I don't remember what the total was. And both goaltenders were defending well. But, I mean, Northwestern has some elite goal scorers and attackers, and Wiseman kept them in it. And if they were to go on and win that, she would have been their MVP and best player. But her anchoring their defensive unit back there is amazing. You can really see now in her fifth season, the head coach, Hannah Nielsen, her fingerprints are all over this Michigan team. I mean, the winning culture, she's found a way to get an edge, much like what Kelly Monte Hiller, her coach, had done at Northwestern so well over their opponents. So she sees the big picture. She She's one of the hardest working people ever i mean kelly monte compared her to larry bird and hannah's <laughs> like you know she's incredible selfless and i think she's really put that onto her players to to implement that in their game on and off the field but they played a solid defensive game against northwestern i mean they packed it in tight they made it really hard to get inside they forced northwestern to adjust and they still kept it very tight so phenomenal goaltending great defense if they could just finish and execute and not be quite as stagnant as they were for a lot of the game on attack I think we could have been looking at a different outcome. So that that was a really big statement game for me, for Michigan, and where they're at with their program against Northwestern. Kaylee Chelios, great stuff. Really appreciate your insights getting people up to speed on women's thank lacrosse you. here in the Big Ten. Thanks for thank joining you, us. Thank you.